to work and live a competent, fair, friendly life. And with that, Mr. Poe, thank you so much for giving me this time. I'm a big admirer of yours, buddy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burton, for your, for your comments. I appreciate the gentleman from Indiana. Uh, several, several comments about uh, wh what you said uh, is important. Uh, the administration, the government says uh, uh, drilling is up in the United States. That is true. But drilling on federal lands is not up. Down 11 percent. The drilling is taking place on state-owned property or private property, but other lands other than federal lands. And if it wasn't for that, drilling would be down in the United States. We go back to the Gulf of Mexico. The same situation we have in the Gulf of Mexico has been ever since the BP incident. Permitting is taking too long. Uh, it takes uh, uh, a record amount of days, sometimes months, to issue a permit in the deep water and in the shallow water. And the shallow water guys operate with a very uh, small amount of capital. They can't stay and wait around for the government to make a decision on a permit or not. So they, don't, they aren't able to drill. In the deep water, those deep, deep water wells, and those rigs, they cost $100,000 a day, mm -hmm. whether they're operating or they're sitting there. And that's why some of them have left the Gulf of Mexico to never return. They've gone down to... South America. They've gone to Africa, off the coast of Africa, to drill where countries are more friendly or friendlier to the drilling safely off of their coast. If I might, I'll yield gentlemen, gentlemen. Gil, for just a second. We sent three billion dollars of American taxpayers' money at a time when we have almost a 16 trillion dollar national debt. We sent it to Brazil, and they're drilling in deep water areas like we would be drilling in off the coast of Mexico, but we can't drill there because of the oil spill and because we can't get permits. So we're sending our taxpayers' dollars down to Brazil so they can do what we can't. And gentlemen, we yield. Yeah. Uh, we're not only sending money down there to develop their oil industry. When they develop it, we're going to buy their oil back. So we're paying them twice. That's right. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Now, I don't know and I don't uh, really uh, suspect that uh, drilling would be the only answer for raising or lowering the, the gasoline prices, but it's one factor because of supply and demand. It's not the only factor, but it's one of those. And uh, it, it just seems to me that the United States uh, uh, is the only major power in the world that has an energy policy that is, we're not going to drill in the United States for all these reasons. But we want you to drill in your country, your natural resources, and we'll buy them from you. Uh, that seems a little bit arrogant on my part, on our part as a nation. Yeah. And uh, I'll yield to the gentleman. Well, let me just say that uh, Sarah Palin, uh, whom everybody in this country knows, as she will tell you, as she's told people all across the country when she speaks, that they have a huge amount of oil in the Anwar and other parts of Alaska. And because of the environmentalists, the radical environmentalist groups in this country, they can't drill up there. Now, I've been up there. I was up there with Don Young. And uh, we saw the oil pipeline. And uh, if you look at the Anwar, there's nothing up there. It's, you're not going to hurt any of the animals. There's a lot of bugs. There's a lot of uh, vermin up there. But you're not going to hurt the animals by drilling up there, and it's certainly not going to hurt the environment. But it would help if we could bring that oil uh, millions of barrels of oil down to the lower 48 states. It would, it would have a tremendous impact, in my opinion, as well as you said, off the Gulf of Mexico and off the continental shelf. We could really move toward energy independence over a period of the next five to ten years. Uh, like you said, it wouldn't happen immediately, but it would be a giant step in the right direction. Uh, gentlemen, if the gentleman would yield, uh, it, as you mentioned about Anwar in Alaska, uh, years ago uh, we came up uh, with this idea of a, a pipeline from Alaska, mm -hmm. bringing crude oil into the United States. And the same people that opposed that pipeline still exist today and are opposing the Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. uh, it took years for uh, the vetting of uh, the environmental lobby to finally be put to rest. I mean, they were concerned about the, the caribou. Uh, uh, of course, I think the caribou are doing quite well now. Um, and finally, Congress decided not to wait on the, that administration and go ahead uh, and make an approval, but Congress went ahead and approved the Alaska Pipeline on its own, which became law in spite of the administration. didn't wait for its approval. 
Uh, and now we know the rest of the story. It's at a su success 25 years later, and that's what Congress needs to do with the Keystone Pipeline. The Canadians, and no one's ever accused Canada, uh, Canada of being uh, environmentally insensitive. Uh, their regulations under standards as tough as the EPA's are even stronger. But yet they've developed a way that they can bring crude oil through a pipeline down to southeast Texas, Port Arthur, my district, uh, in a safe environmental way and also one of the newest and finest uh, pipelines. Uh, but the administration says not so fast. And, it, and it's unfortunate because the jobs will stay in America create that pipeline. Canada is not a Middle Eastern dictatorship. Nope. They're kind of a normal country. You know. <laughs> and um, we should approve that as soon as possible. I understand the concern in Nebraska. I'm glad to see that the folks in Nebraska are working with uh, uh, TransCanada to reroute that 60 miles so there is no environmental issues uh, and get this pipeline approved and start shipping that crude oil uh, down to southeast Texas so we can use it in the United States. And it would seem to me that the United States should maybe think about this type of energy policy, that we should drill safely in the United States for oil and natural gas. And I say safely because that is important. But we should also partner with the countries next to us, the Canadians to the north who have natural resources and the Mexicans to the south who have an abundance of natural resources. And the three of us work together on a North American OPEC-type philosophy and be energy independent, not just energy independent, but it'll help our national security. And if we do that, if we work with Canada, Mexico, drill in the United States where it's safe, we can make the Middle East irrelevant. We can make that little fella from the desert, Ahmadinejad, and his threats about closing <laughs> the Straits of Hormuz, we can make him irrelevant. We don't care what he does. And we don't need to continue to send our money to other nations over there that don't like us. So maybe that's something we need to do in the United States. And lastly, and then I'll, I'll yield to the gentleman, um, because of American technology, because of those folks that know how to drill safely for oil and natural gas. The United States now suddenly is becoming an abundant nation with natural gas. Mm -hmm. And we could, if we developed it the way that we can, the United States, primarily Texas, but other states, we could become the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. Yeah, that's right. We could export natural gas. We have so much of it. And then bring that money into the United States rather than constantly sending money throughout the world, all because we don't take care of what we have and use what we have. I'll yield to the gentleman. Well, T. T Boone Pickens said, uh, and everybody knows he's one of the big advocates of natural gas, uh, which is a clean burning fuel, very clean burning fuel. He said if we would convert the tractor trailer units to bring commerce to all of us, uh, he said we could lower the cost for all those tractor trailer units as far as energy consumption is concerned by 50 percent. Cut it in two. And that would have a dramatic impact on things that are transported by tractor trailer units. And I'd just like to say that the president, when he took office, and I'll conclude with this because uh, you've done such a good job tonight, you cover it very well. But the president, when he took office, he said that his energy policies would of necessity cause energy costs to skyrocket. Well, as Ronald Reagan would say, well, he did. And energy prices have skyrocketed. And we've got to do something about it. The American people don't want to pay 4 or $5 a gallon for gasoline. They can't live that way. It's causing a deterioration in their standard of living. And so if I were talking to the president, and I know I can't, Madam Speaker, but if I were talking to him, I'd say, Mr. President, why don't you get with the program? The American people really need your help. And if you don't pay attention to them, regarding the energy policies, it's my humble opinion that there may be a big change in administrations next year. So for political survivability alone, you ought to take another look at what you're doing. And with that, I thank the gentleman very much for yielding to me. I thank the gentleman for uh, his participation. And Madam Speaker, uh, it seems to me that uh, the United States can make some decisions and solve some of our own problems. And uh, we can start with uh, finding people in the EPA that are uh, not have their own personal vendetta against the oil and gas industry. Replace those individuals like Armanderas and get some fair and balanced uh, bureaucrats to make sure we have a clean environment to work with 
our energy companies rather than against them and stop the war against uh, uh, the energy companies in the U.S. And we can work and bring down the price of energy in the United States. One way, not the only way, is to make, the, uh, make sure that we have uh, a supply. And that's a greater supply, as we all know, of anything does help reduce the cost of energy so that people in southeast Texas who have a hard time getting to work, who are paying more for products that they have to buy, just like Americans throughout our nation are having tough times because of high gasoline prices, we owe it to them to do that, to take care of ourselves and to work with Canada, work with Mexico, so that the three countries can be a strong ally, not just politically, but that we can be strong allies with our energy economy. And with that, uh, I'll yield back to the chair, and that's just the way it is. <laughs> the gentleman from Texas yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Nebraska is recognized for 25 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I was shopping for some family items recently, I noted how difficult it is to find items that are made in America. While America manufacturing is encouragingly enough on the rebound, products ranging from hairbrushes to iPods still carry that made in China label. All the while, many questions about China and its economic policies, foreign policies, and human rights records are left largely unexamined. For the good of our economy, it is essential that we thoroughly understand China's record and their intentions as a country. Our nations have a complicated, lopsided economic relationship. Americans buy great quantities of Chinese-made products. China finances a great portion of America's debt. Currently, nearly one-third of our debt is foreign-owned, with China easily being the largest debt holder at nearly $1.2 trillion. Other estimates peg the figure at closer to $2 trillion. The effect of such indebtedness is the shift of our wealth assets into the hands of a foreign nation, losing the market for American-made products to a country with lax labor and environmental standards, which manipulates its currency and creates, creates unbalanced and unfair trading conditions. China's involvement on the world stage is also of significant concern. While it aggressively pursues its own mercantilistic agenda, China lends little constructive hand to creating conditions for international stability. China is seen as an enabler of North Korea, who is actively pursu pursuing nuclear weapons capabilities. And it ca they continue on their march toward more aggressive missile testing as well, despite the protest of the international community. Over recent months, as the U.S. and the European Union have accelerated important efforts to curb Iran's nuclear ambition, China has been conspicuously absent from the leadership table in this discussion. China continues to be a top buyer of Iranian oil, one of the key leverage points of economic sanctions against Iran. At a, at a discussion I attended, a Chinese official in so many words said, the U.S. is to blame for, for Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons capability. And he went on to say that while China does not desire this outcome, we're going to do business as usual. Africa is becoming a lost continent diplomatically and economically in favor of international players who do not have the same regard for human rights as we do. China's influence in resource-rich Africa is growing rapidly with disturbing consequences. Direct Chinese investment in Africa has grown exponentially over the last two years. One million Chinese nationals now do business in Africa, and Chinese energy and mineral resource companies are quickly acquiring oil fields and mines. In the process, China has forged strategic alliances with war criminals. According to China's foreign ministry spokesman, China shares, quote, a deep and profound friendship with Sudanese war criminal Omar al-Bashir. I should note, there was a bright spot this week. When approached by South Sudanese President Salva Kiir for assistance as Sudan and South Sudan marched toward war, China's President Hu Jintao echoed the United States in calling for peace and negotiation between the two countries, 
rather than continuing to back Omar, Omar al-Bashir. The international community will look upon China's new role as a diplomatic figure in this conflict with great interest. Beyond this, an honest discussion is necessary about Chinese industrial virtues. A Chinese official has said that in dealing with differences in corporate culture and the degree of openness to the outside world, Chinese companies always take domestic business practices with them. Chinese companies always take domestic, businesses practices, domestic business practices with them. Those practices, according to witnesses who have given congressional testimony, include fertility monitors on factory floors, invasive, invasively examining female employees for pregnancy, and reporting pregnant women to the Chinese family planning police. China has practiced the violence of forced abortion. China also has tra tragically high suicide rates for workers who use suicide as their only means of collective bargaining against dire and oppressive labor conditions. As China continues to advance as a world economic power, it has a choice. It can join the responsible community of nations in respecting the dignity and rights of all persons while conducting affairs with other nations in an ethical fashion, or it can stand by current practices and exploit relationships in order to fuel its own brand of corporate collectivism, undermining international stability in the process. Madam Speaker, it is my belief that it is important to seek reasonable and good relationships with China, a country with a rich cultural history, a country which is rapidly ascending onto the world stage. We must do, I, do so ideally and practically for the sake of our own national security. But we must do so with open eyes, fully understanding the implications when all of us buy products with that Made in China label. Madam Speaker, I yield back to the Chair the balance of the time. The gentleman from Nebraska yields back the balance of his time. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. The gentleman from Georgia. Right here. Oh, I see. Okay. The gentleman from Georgia, under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from Georgia is recognized for 18 minutes as the designee of the Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I thank you for the, for the time and being down here with me. I had to set up my, my chart tonight because I can't commit it all to, uh, to memory. I, I'm glad to, to be here at the end of the, the leadership hour. We've talked about China. We've talked about U.S. Uh, energy. We've talked about the big issues that are on the, on the floor of this House and are, are here in, in Washington, D.C. And I want to say to folks, I come from a conservative part of the world. I come from the Deep South. I come from the, the uh, suburbs of, of Atlanta, Gwinnett County, Forsyth County, Walton County, Barrow County. But I brought with me tonight quotes from President Barack Obama because, I've, as I have said in town hall meeting after town hall meeting, I, I disagree with about 80% of what the president does, but I believe in about 80% of what he says. And, and I think if we can come together around some of those principles that, that he's been enunciating, we might be able to make some real progress. Let me, let me show you what I have here. This is from, uh, Madam Speaker, the president's uh, 2011 inaugural address. He says this. At stake right now is not who wins the next election. At stake is whether new jobs and industries take root in this country or somewhere else. And that is absolutely true. Folks come down to the floor of this house every day. They say what they're doing. They're doing for job creation. They say what they're doing. They're doing for economic growth. But we have a substantial disagreement about what that means. And I happen to believe that one of the things that encourages job creation and economic growth is fiscal responsibility. We need fiscal responsibility in our families, we need it in our businesses, and we need it in our government. The President said this, Madam Speaker. His State of the Union address in, in 2010, he said, families across the country are tightening their belts and making tough decisions. The federal government should do the same. 
Say the union address, 2010, the federal government should do the same. It wasn't just in 2010. I'm not cherry-picking comments. Here we are in the president's State of the Union address in 2011, Madam Speaker. Every day, families sacrifice to live within their means. They deserve a government that does the same. He said it in 2010. He, he said it in 2011. In fact, go back to the beginning of his presidency. Here we are in 2009, the same State of the Union address. Given these realities, everyone in this chamber, Democrats and Republicans, will have to sacrifice some worthy priorities for which there are no dollars. And that includes me, Madam Speaker. He was right there in front of where you sit tonight. He said, given these realities, everyone in this chamber must sacrifice some worthy priorities for which there are no dollars, and that includes me, the President of the United States. But what's the reality, Madam Speaker? We, we, we can put the words back up. We can put the words up from 2009, from 2010, from 2011. But what's the reality? The reality, sadly, is this chart, Madam Speaker. You can't see it from, from where you are, but it's a, it's a chart from the Wall Street Journal entitled The Debt Boom. It charts the, federal, the public debt uh, of the United States from the year 2000 to the year 2012. And what we see, Madam Speaker, is that as a percent of GDP, the debt was entirely too high during the Bush years. Don't get me wrong. There is not a party in this town that is blameless in this, in this debate. For Pete's sakes, we were having economic boom times, and our debt was running 35% of GDP. 35% of all the economy of the United States of America was being borrowed in, in debt. But look what happens. Look what happens. President Obama is, is sworn in in January of 2009. You see a debt boom where we rise from 35% of GDP as our debt level up to 80% of GDP as our debt level. Now, I, again, I can put the words back up. Time for sacrifice. Families are tightening their belts. We must do the same. Everyone must sacrifice priorities, including me, the President of the United States. I can put the words back up. But the reality, Madam Speaker, is that the President has continued to promote spending with reckless abandon. And, and it's not just in the, in the debt. Madam Speaker, this chart is a is a chart produced by the Budget Committee on which I have the privilege of, of serving. And what it charts is the debt of the United States. We see that on, a, on the white dotted line here. And it charts the proposed plan of President Barack Obama. You know, the President, to his credit, introduced a budget in January. The law requires him to do it, and he did it. In fact, he has every uh, year that he has been in office. The law requires the Senate to produce a budget every year. They ignore that law and have again uh, this year for the third time in a row. But the president produced his budget. I can again go back to the words where he talks about sacrifice, where he talks about tightening his belt, where he talks about what American families are doing and says America deserves a government that does the same. But look at this chart. The white dotted line represents the current debt path of America. The red line represents the president's proposal from February of this year. And if you look closely, Madam Speaker, what you can see is that under the President's proposal of February of this year, enacting the President's proposal raises the deficit of the United States year after year after year after year, 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, more than doing nothing. Madam Speaker, you ask, how can that be true? The President's proposal includes $2 trillion in new taxes on American families. That's true. That's true. The President has made no uh, secret of his desire to work our way through our current economic crisis by taxing the American people. I don't believe that's the right way to go, but he's introduced that as a plan. And yes, his budget raises taxes by $2 trillion, but he spends so much more that even with a $2,000 tax increase, Madam Speaker, we don't see any improvement in our debt in 2013 or 14 or 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 or 21. Now, I've blown up, Madam Speaker. Just so folks can see it way out there in 2022, you finally begin to see a better debt trajectory from the president's budget than if we had done nothing. Nine years from now, America would have a slightly lower deficit under the president's plan than if we did nothing and just left all of our systems on autopilot. That doesn't jive with what we heard. Can I go back to the beginning, Madam Speaker? 
At stake is not who wins the election. At stake is new jobs, new jobs that come through fiscal responsibility, go back to a State of the Union address. Families across the country are tightening their belts and making tough decisions. The federal government should do the same. Madam Speaker, there's not one tough decision made when you tax the American people by two trillion dollars but you spend even more I believed the president I believed the president when he said given these realities everyone in this chamber Republicans and Democrats will have to sacrifice some worthy priorities for which there are no dollars he was right when he said that. That was an applause line, Madam Speaker. Folks got to their feet here in the House chamber. He's right. That sacrifice is necessary. His budget includes none of it. The good news, though, Madam Speaker, is we're not limited to the President's ideas in this town. We have a freshman class here in Washington, D.C., Madam Speaker, which you are a critical part that says we can do better. In fact, we must do better. In fact, we cannot take no for an answer. Let me show you what I have here, Madam Speaker. It's a chart of discretionary appropriations. Now, discretionary appropriations uh, for folks who are in the uh, freshman class or haven't uh, followed that uh, uh, back in their, in their offices, you know, that's the part that we have to affirmatively act on every year. About two-thirds of the federal budget is on autopilot. If we close the doors of Congress tomorrow, that money would continue to flow out the door, but not so with one-third of the federal budget. We call that discretionary spending. And you and I, Madam Speaker, we have responsibility to, to do oversight on that every year. Look what we see here. FY 2010, that's the first year I've charted. We spent about $1.3 trillion in this discretionary spending. That was 2010. You and I were not yet here, Madam Speaker. You and I showed up while we were still working on the FY 2011 budget. And you'll see we spent less in this Congress. And I don't just mean we proposed spending less. I don't just mean we talked about spending less. I don't mean that we got together as Republicans and said this is our idea, but we're not going to be able to get the Democrats to go along with it. I mean, as a body in this House, as a Congress on Capitol Hill, with the cooperation of the President's signature, we actually passed into law a budget for discretionary spending that went down in 2011 from 2010 levels. And guess what? We didn't stop there, Madam Speaker. As you know, we passed another set of appropriations bills that took the spending down even further from 2011 levels. We went down further in 2012. And guess what? This freshman class, we're not done yet. This House leadership, they're not done yet. For 2013, we are on track to reduce spending. I don't mean reduce rates of growth. I don't mean reduce projected increases. I mean reduce the actual dollars going out the door for a third year in a row. The third year in a row. It's unprecedented. It hadn't happened since World War II. And it's happened because the American people said we have to do better. It happened because the American people said we can't just talk about it. We have to do it. But I've got some bad news, Madam Speaker. We're going to keep working on this discretionary spending side of the, the ledger. We're going to keep trying to drive those numbers down. But that's not where the real spending is. As I said a few minutes ago, that's only a third of the budget. Two-thirds of the budget's on autopilot. I have it up here, uh, Madam Speaker. In yellow, you see what they call mandatory spending. That's the autopilot money. Again, you could close the White House tomorrow. You could close the Congress tomorrow. This money still flows out the door. If we're going to stop it, we have to act affirmatively to stop it. This little piece of the pie up here is the defense part. You know, you would think that national security is one of the biggest things we spend money on around here. Madam Speaker, it's down to, to less than 20 percent of the money that goes out the door in Washington, D.C. goes towards national security. This 17 percent here is everything else. Everything else that's in that discretionary budget, the 63 percent, 64 percent, so says the Congressional Budget Office, this is the mandatory spending that's on autopilot. I have it displayed here in a slightly, slightly different way. The, the red uh, bar represents our discretionary spending, and you can see that discretionary spending as a percentage of the budget as a percentage of the budget, has been in decline each and every year since 1962. Now, those aren't actual dollars going down. That's just the share of what we do in Washington, D.C. It's been this Congress that's brought the actual dollars down, as I said, from the first time since World War II. But 
over time, we've had a shift in this country. Discretionary spending has declined as a percentage of what we do, and this out of control mandatory spending, this autopilot spending, is increasing. What are we going to do about that? There's not enough time tonight, Madam Speaker, to get into the details, but I encourage all of our colleagues, Madam Speaker, and I hope you will help me to encourage them, to keep an eye out on what's coming down the road, because what's coming down the road in this body is a process called reconciliation. And I, I put to you that we haven't had a real successful reconciliation process in this House since 1997. And in 1997, Republicans in the House and Senate and a Democrat in the White House came together to pass the biggest spending reduction uh, bill that we'd had in our lifetime prior to this point. We can't balance the budget on the, on the discretionary spending side of the ledger alone. As you know, Madam Speaker, if we zeroed out everything, and I mean everything, I don't mean cut by 5%, I don't mean cut by 10%, I mean zeroed out everything except Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, interest on the national debt, those mandatory spending programs that I'm talking about, those autopilot programs, if we zeroed out everything else, the budget still wouldn't be balanced. That's how far out of whack we are, and that's how big those categories are. We're going to do something that hadn't been done since 1997, and that is go through reconciliation where we ask the committees of this House, where we go back to our communities and ask in town hall meetings, what can we do on that mandatory spending side of the ledger to tighten our belts, to do better, to provide more bang for their buck to the American taxpayers? Those bills are going to start coming to the floor in the month of May for the first time since 1997 in a serious way. Now, it's going to, it's going to be a small process at first. We're talking uh, about uh, just the amount of money to, to uh, cover some of our necessary defense spending needs. But we're going to start to talk about priorities here. And I say talk about, I mean legislate on. Madam Speaker, the talking has already been done. Every day, families sacrifice to live within their means. They deserve a government that does the same. President Barack Obama, 2011. Families across the country are tightening their belts and making tough decisions. The federal government should do the same. President Obama, 2010. At stake right now is not who wins the election. At stake is whether new jobs and industries take root in this country or not. Madam Speaker, we are bankrupting this country. We are bankrupting this country. We have doubled, doubled the annual spending deficits that we've seen in this country. We've seen the public debt of this nation increase by 50% in the last three and a half years. And that was with the efforts of the most conservative U.S. House of Representatives we've seen in our lifetime. That was with the efforts of this U.S. House of Representatives that has cut spending not one year in a row, not two years in a row, but three years in a row. Madam Speaker, the good ship United States of America is in troubled waters. The President is saying all the right things. I come to the floor here tonight, Madam Speaker, to ask you to encourage him to do the right things. Join this U.S. House of Representatives. Join these 100 new Democrat and freshman members in this body as we try to do something that hasn't been done since 1997. And that's take programs off of autopilot and make sure that every dollar leaving this institution is doing the very best that it can for the hardworking American taxpayers that have entrusted us to spend it. Madam Speaker, I thank you for being uh, uh, here and uh, yielding me this time this evening, and I yield that time uh, back to you. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, for 30 minutes.
<clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. A lot going on in the world these days. An interesting trip to Afghanistan this weekend, country into which we are pouring billions and billions of dollars and have military there that is keeping Karzai, President Karzai, in office. And he's a very grateful man. That was demonstrated when he told our government, our, this Obama administration, that Dana Rohrbacher, my very dear friend, one of the greatest patriots I know, would not be allowed into Afghanistan as if he had that power uh, because he had been very critical of uh, President Karzai. So we're spending billions and billions of dollars so that a cantankerous president of, of Afghanistan who is only there because of the lives and treasures that Americans have sacrificed. Turn around telling Americans we don't want members of Congress that actually control the purse strings to money flowing into this country. We don't want them here. It's rather interesting. And as might be expected, President Karzai had his facts entirely wrong. He was representing that um, Representative Rohrbacher had a bill that was attempting to partition, divide up Afghanistan. Entirely wrong. I knew that because I assisted with the bill and co-sponsored it proudly because it was a resolution that basically was encouraging uh, Afghanistan to allow elections of their regional governors. Uh, it, it, it encouraged elections. And somehow President Karzai found this very offensive as a threat to him. And, and I can see it from his standpoint. If one puts oneself in his position, you realize, gee, I'm President Karzai. I get to appoint every regional governor. And gee, that would be a system like ancient Rome where you would be appointed to be governor, but you had to kick back to Caesar in order to keep your seat. Interesting. Um, that's, that's a plan fraught with the potential for corruption. It's one of the reasons that Dana and I and so many others think it would be a good idea, help strengthen the country, if the people in the various regions were able to elect their governors. President Karzai not only appoints the governors, he appoints the mayors. They don't get to elect them. He appoints them. You want to be a mayor of a city? You better go suck up to President Karzai because he's going to make the appointment. If you would like to be the chief of police, don't worry with some local city council in Afghanistan. Don't worry with the governor. You'll be appointed, that's right, by President Karzai. Hmm. We're told by Afghans that actually it goes so much further than that. He even appoints uh, many of the teachers. You want to be a teacher at an upper level? Uh, Afghans tell me that uh, he appoints them as well. President Karzai gets to appoint a slate of, of uh, potential legislators. He has tremendous control of the purse strings in Afghanistan. Not someone to be countered with, you would think unless perhaps you're from a government that assists the government of, Pac uh, of Afghanistan in meeting its budget needs. As I understand it, Afghanistan has a budget of $12.5 billion. As I understand it, Afghanistan provides one 
and a half billion of that twelve and a half billion dollar budget. That's all the revenue, taxes, fees, all kinds of things. That's that's the extent of their revenue. Gee, what would happen to President Karzai if all of a sudden this Congress did what the 1974 Democratic controlled Congress did when without any regard for those who had fought with us in Vietnam and Southeast Asia, every penny was just completely shut off. Every penny being spent in Afghanistan was um, in, in Vietnam back in 74 cut off. And what happened after we left was an absolute horrible bloodbath of those who had assisted the United States in any way. So, I don't think this Congress will be as abrupt as the Democratic Congress was in 1974, but it certainly has the ability to do that. The difference is, I think there are enough people in this Congress that realize unless we empower those who fought the Taliban in late 2001 after after 9/11 and in early 2002 when they basically routed the Taliban with US embedded support and air support uh, unless we empower those allies by allowing them to elect their own regional governors by allowing them to elect their mayors taking some of the power away from a central administration where regardless of whether or not reports may or may not be accurate about corruption at the highest level, there is certainly corruption in Afghanistan. And it is also interesting that this administration refuses to replace the inspector general who is supposed to supervise and inspect and audit the money that's going into Afghanistan. Surely that couldn't be because it's an election year. Surely that couldn't be because if we had somebody actually monitoring where all the billions of dollars were pouring, to, pouring into Afghanistan are going, the report would, would indicate widespread corruption, which would reflect poorly on this administration throwing away billions of dollars not only to cylinders around the country but to corrupt administrations who are fattening their bank accounts while Americans don't have any. Many Americans struggle to have any money in their bank accounts and yet we're propping up an administration over there that thinks that on a whim they can say I don't like this congressman because he's been critical of my administration, so we're going to keep them out. Now, I realize that Secretary Clinton inher inherited a very difficult situation that was not of her making. But it is important in dealing with matters of foreign policy, dealing with matters of state, that we not be duped by people who have made careers out of duping Americans and Russians and other nationalities. So we have a great ally in the nation of Israel. They believe in freedom as we do. They have a truly representative government one in which the Prime Minister of Israel does not forbid elections of other officials so that he is the only one who has the power to appoint. Israel allows elections. And as others have pointed out, they're more likely more free than any of the other neighbors immediately surrounding Israel. And even Muslims in Israel have greater freedom to elect whoever they wish, whomever they wish, in fair and free elections. 
we have an ally in Israel. Now, I realize there are differences in views of whether the Old Testament, the Torah, the Tanakh, have valid uh, legitimacy these days. Some of us believe them and are proud to do so, just as the founders, heck, we had uh, of the 56 signers of the Declaration, over a third of them were uh, ordained Christian ministers who believed every word of the Old Testament. So I've been looking uh, in the Old Testament for wisdom and application to our current situation because, you know, we know back in uh, earlier this year, uh, the Washington Post was told by this administration that the window during which Israel was going to likely attack Iran was between two different dates during a certain period. Well, that's not very helpful to an ally. When we tell the world about when an ally may choose to defend itself, that's more a heads up to an enemy of Israel in the United States, a sworn enemy of the, of the United States, led by people who have sworn to the destruction of the United States and Israel. So it's a little bit confusing to see how this administration could be going about betraying our friend Israel. It would seem that when this administration leaked to the media that our dear friend and ally Israel was going to utilize a relationship with Azerbaijan to attack that such a release was not something you would do for a friend, but rather a betrayal of a friend and ally. Uh, it appears that those were efforts to keep Israel from doing what it needed to defend itself. When this administration is telling Israel, hey, just trust us. Trust us, we'll take care of your national security. And yes, there's a window beyond which you can no longer do any good in trying to stop the nuclear proliferation in Iran and beyond which we in the United States could. So if we can just force Israel past that window, then they would have to rely completely on the United States to do all in its power to protect Israel. If Israel looks at what has been happening already this year, a couple of betrayals of our friendship, that would not bode well that the top in this administration for this country will protect Israel at whatever cost. It has to be considered by Israel. And then we have this report. This was dated uh, April 19, 2012, from the Middle East Media Research Institute. Uh, the introduction says, an important element in the renewal of nuclear negotiations with Iran in the talks in Istanbul, April 13th, 14th, 2012, was an alleged fatwa attributed to Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, according to which the production, stockpiling, and use of nuclear weapons are forbidden under Islam, and that the Islamic Republic of Iran shall never acquire these weapons. Indeed, U.S. leaders, among them Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and even U.S. President Barack Obama, along with other representatives to the talks, the International Atomic Energy Agency Board of Governors and even highly respected research institutes considered the fatwa as an actual fact and examined its significance and implications for the nuclear negotiations with Iran that were renewed in Istanbul. 
However, an investigation by the Middle East Media Research Institute reveals that no such fatwa ever existed or was ever published and that media reports about it are nothing more than a propaganda ruse on the part of the Iranian regime apparatuses in an attempt to deceive the top U.S. administration officials and the others mentioned above. Iranian regime officials' presentation of facts on nuclear weapons attributed to Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei as a fatwa or religious edict when no such fatwa existed or was issued by him is a propaganda effort to propose to the West a religiously valid substitute for concrete guarantees of inspectors' access to Iran's nuclear facilities. Since the West does not consider mere statements by Khomeini or other regime officials to be credible, the Iranian regime has put forth a fraudulent fatwa that the West would be more inclined to trust. It goes on to talk about, uh, and, and I'll just read from this, U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton clarified that she had discussed the fatwa with, quote, experts and religious scholars, unquote, and also with Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan at the NATO conference in Norfolk, Virginia in early April. She stated, quote, the other interesting develop with development which you may have followed, was the repetition by the Supreme Leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei, that they would, that he had issued a fatwa against nuclear weapons, against weapons of mass destruction. Prime Minister Erdogan and I discussed this at some length, and I've discussed with a number of experts and religious scholars. And if it's indeed a statement of principle of values, then it is a starting point for being operationalized, which means that it serves as the entryway into a negotiation as to how you demonstrate that it is indeed a sincere, authentic statement of conviction. So we will test that as well. During his visit to, uh, unquote, during his visit to Tehran in late March in an interview with Iranian state television, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan said, quote, I've shared the leader Khomeini's statement with U.S. President Barack Obama and told him that in face of this assertion, I do not have a, position, a different position, and they Iranians are using nuclear energy peacefully, unquote. On April 7, 2012, Cayenne International reported, citing Press TV, that Turkish Foreign Minister Ahmet Davutoglu had told the Turkish Tanai TV that there is no possibility that, quote, Khomeini's fatwa forbidding the possession and use of nuclear weapons might be disobeyed in Iran. So we can all celebrate. There's been a fraudulent, false report of a fatwa by Khomeini, so gosh, nobody in Iran would violate this fatwa, making it um, against the Islamic religion to develop nuclear weapons. When the truth is, if Israel is not going to defend itself by itself, as President Obama said, it absolutely must on more than one occasion. If it is going to rely on the representations of this administration to trust us, we'll take care of you, we got your back, then Israel may want to note how easy it is to deceive this administration into believing what it wants, that Iran would not develop nuclear weapons. And it is important to note that this administration has uh, been praised in messages coming from the Islamic Society of North America and other groups, actually named co-conspirators in funding terrorism in the world. 
They've been praised by these named co-conspirators in funding terrorism uh, for their cleansing of training materials of our FBI, of our intelligence, of our State Department. We have gone through and eliminated words like jihad, words like Islam, words like radical, replacing them with things like violent extremism. When the trouble is, it is so easy to deceive national officials in any country where they refuse to study the enemy who has sworn to destroy them. If you will not study the enemy who has sworn to destroy you and your country, then you will continue to be easily duped. So we have these named co-conspirators for funding terrorism out there praising this administration and their meetings inside the hearts of this administration at the State Department, in the White House, in the Justice Department. They've been praised for eliminating all these references to such inappropriate things as Islam. Well, this weekend, despite efforts by some in this administration to prevent it, a few of us met with our allies, members of the National Front, one of which could be elected the next president in Af Afghanistan. These are people who, while we in America were burying Americans, they were burying family members who had fought with us against the Taliban. These are the enemy of our enemy, the Taliban. They should be our friends, and they are my friends. Therefore, when I saw my Muslim friends there at the home of my friend Masood, there were big hugs all around. This administration calls them war criminals because some of them fight as viciously as the Taliban that they fight against. But they were friends. They fought with us. They did much of our fighting for us before we became occupiers in Afghanistan. Yet, when this administration throws our allies under a bus, it means for them to stay there. Well, some of us believe if we ever hope to have other allies, then it is critical that we treat our allies with respect. We don't stab them in the back. We don't throw them under the bus. But that's a lesson hard learned. You know, there are international reports that say President Karzai may be willing to resign a year early. That's been heard different places around the world. And gee, wow, isn't that wonderful? If Karzai would resign a year early, but in meeting with my friends who have talked to some of Karzai's uh, circle, they point out, do you in America not understand when this President Karzai says he's looking at resigning a year early, it's not because he is some big-hearted, wonderful, democracy-loving person. If he loved democracy, he'd let us elect our governors. He'd let us elect our mayors. But he wants to appoint them. And he's not ready to give up power, but the Afghan Constitution apparently says that if you've served two terms, you cannot run for a third term. So this President Karzai is looking at a way when perhaps if he was resigned a year early, then he could argue, I didn't serve two terms. I, I served uh, one year short of two terms, therefore I can run for a third term. And being as how the president of Afghanistan appoints the governors, the mayors, the chiefs of police, so many of the positions of power in Afghanistan, 
it's quite conceivable that he could ensure that he got elected again next time if he ran a third time. And if he were to be allowed to run a third time and get elected, that puts him beyond 2014, which means the United States will not be around to enforce the promises that President Karzai made. Oh, it's a hope and prayer that this, in, that this administration will quit living on the false promises of people who say they are going to help us but are sworn publicly and privately to destroy our way of life. And there are those we continue to hear say, look, Israel is just occupiers. They're occupiers in this land. The Palestinians have more claim, but as Newt Gingrich pointed out, uh, the term of Palestinian is a very recent word that found usage. And if you go back, and, and, and as uh, one reporter who ended up being let go, but she marveled that these people ought to go back to Poland or wherever they came from, when actually when you look at where they came from, uh, 16, 1700 years before Muhammad existed in this city of Hebron, a king named David ruled for seven years. And then he moved the capital up to Jerusalem. And a beautiful capital it was. Some have said, well, where is the evidence of the Israelis being in Jerusalem? Well, and we know that uh, Muhammad never went to Jerusalem. He had a dream, as I understand it, at one point that he had gone there, but he never physically went, that's for sure. But uh, here is the current city of Jerusalem. Uh, this is the city of David here, south of the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, where Abraham went. And it's interesting because People have said, gee, you know, where, where's the archaeological evidence? And we see people around the country in Hebron, there where Jesse was, was buried, where his tomb is. Uh, in in uh, what I call Shiloh, they were calling Shiloh, the Ark of the Covenant. They found the location, certainly appears, where it was kept for over 300 years, long before there was a Muhammad. So people have said, well, where, where is the evidence? Well, it is beginning to show up in droves. Quite interesting. As the archaeologists have begun to look, they realized, you know what? The city of David may have been south down the hill from where the current Temple Mount is. And they began excavating, and they found all kinds of of dramatic evidence of Israel's existence. It's dramatic. There is no question from the things that are being found and the, the way they're being dated, the dates that are, are coming to light, that Israel existed in the land where it has its country now, not just in part, but throughout the West Bank. That was Israeli territory many, many centuries before a man named Muhammad lived. I'm not attempting to push my religious beliefs on anybody else. These are simply the facts of history that we have to look at and understand. And until the federal government, the, the administration, until we have an administration that stops blinding those who are supposed to protect us, we're in big trouble. So it is important that we pay tribute to our dear friend Israel, stop the betrayals, and say thank God for the nation of Israel and the dear friend that they are to the United States. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back.